So we'll be coming back to Jeremiah chapter 30 uh, at the end of the sermon. But if you want to go back to uh, 2 Samuel, go back to uh, 2, Sa- 2 Samuel. Uh, we're going to go back to uh, chapter 7. Chapter 7. And there was something, uh, you know, this last Thursday, of course, we were in 2 Samuel. And I didn't have uh, time to really get into it. Uh, but I wanted to, you know, I don't want to go over this chapter and not touch, uh, speak about the subject. It was just, it's kind of a bigger subject, uh, but, uh, you know, I, there was other things to preach on Thursday night. But if you're there in 2 Samuel chapter uh, uh, verse 8, it says, there now, uh, Therefore shalt thou say to my servant David, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep coat, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my, uh, my people Israel. And I was with thee whithersoever thou wentest, and have cut off all thine enemies out of thy sight, and have made thee a great name like unto the great, uh, uh, of the great men of the earth. And uh, we'll just, just jump down here for the sake of time, down to uh, verse 12. And he says, and when, uh, and when thy days be fulfilled, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, and I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall be, uh, build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the, uh, the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. And what I want uh, uh, to preach about this morning is the topic of the Davidic covenant. The Davidic covenant. This is a real uh, you know, a major portion of scripture. Uh, you know, a lot of people uh, look at this and say this is a major, you know, turning point in scripture, or at least it's a, it's a, it's a milestone. Okay, this is a, a, a huge, a very important passage because you have, uh, you know, the Lord is making covenant here with David regarding his throne, and a lot of doctrine is built off of this, and there's some really great truths that we can learn from this. Uh, you know, regarding the Lord and, and things like that. But the Davidic covenant here is basically what? Is a, is a promise, you know. And, and stay with me this morning. I know this is going to be a little bit, maybe a little bit drier for some folks. This isn't going to be your normal, you know, motivational, face-ripping sermon, but it's going to be more of a doctrinal one. But, you know, stay with me because there is a great truth that we can learn from this, all right, that, uh, you know, that the Christ is the fulfillment of all covenants. And, and you know, that is a, a great testimony to the Word of God that, uh, you know, he was setting up all of these covenants throughout the years, all to be fulfilled in, the Christ, in Christ, you know, thousands of years later. But basically, we're talking about the Davidic covenant this morning. And what is the Davidic covenant? What is that? What does that mean? Well, covenant is just basically promise. You know, I'm not going to take the time to explain all that, but if you, you know, you could just look that up in a dictionary. You can just compare scripture with scripture. You can see that when God is making a promise to people, he is making a covenant with them, Okay. You know, and people make a big deal out of covenants. Sometimes people go too far with this. Uh, you know, they, they want to just really make a big deal by the fact that he made a covenant with Adam. He made a covenant with Noah. He made a covenant with Abraham. He made a covenant, you know, uh, with Moses and the children of Israel. He made a covenant regarding the land of Palestine. He made a covenant with David. He made, made, they want to go on and on about all these covenants. And, you know, they're there. It's a biblical concept that God made specific promises to specific people throughout time. But to what end? To the end that we would understand that Christ is the fulfillment of all of those covenants, that Christ would be glorified. And, you know, and the people go off into strange, you know, doctrines. They get into dispensationalism and they want to start talking about how God dealt with man in different ways. You know, and they use some of these covenants as uh, their proof text. But, you know, I, I don't really buy into that. You know, I do. You can't. But you can't sit here and say, well, God never made a covenant. There is no such thing as the Davidic covenant. No, there is the Davidic covenant because he did make a covenant with David. You know, we just read that there in 2 Samuel chapter 7. But, you know, with all covenants, you, you know, there, there's this idea that some things are, you know, some things are unconditional and then some things are conditional. Sometimes God makes these promises and sometimes there's strings attached to these promises, these covenants that he makes with throughout the Bible, okay? So basically, the way you, one way you could break this down is to look at every covenant as either a grant or a treaty, as a grant or a treaty. Now, we probably understand what a grant is, right? If someone were to grant you something, it means that it's basically a gift, like they just give you something with no strings attached, right? That would be, if I were to grant you money, you know, for, hey, I need a grant, you know, you might even heard of, you know, people getting a grant from the government, grant from, you know, some institution, that's money that's given to them that's not expected to be paid back, 
right? It's not a loan, it's a difference. There's no strings attached. It's something that's just given to them, okay? And when we get into these covenants, what we see often is that God uh, gives them in the form of a grant. He just says, hey, I'm making this promise to you, no strings attached. This is the way it's going to be, regardless of, you know, your behavior. The, the, the recipient of that covenant, that grant, that promise is, is uh, you know, is not obligated, right? It's actually the, the, the giver that's obligated. He's made the promise and he's going to come through, right? Because he's, he's the one that's put himself out there. He's not, there's no strings attached. And then you have, you know, what's considered a treaty. You know, if, if we were to look at a covenant, we could look at it more of a treaty, you know, where we, where, where both parties have something to give, right? If we were to sit down and write up like a contract, you know, hey, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z, but you have to make sure that you do X, Y, and Z. And if either party, you know, fails to meet those obligations, that treaty is broken, okay? <clears throat> now, we could look at several passages, kind of get the meaning of this, get the, the idea of this. You know, in Acts 11, you know, remember when uh, uh, Peter was coming back and giving the report to the church of Jerusalem of the, you know, what happened. Uh, you know, with Cornelius and the Gentiles, how this Holy Spirit came upon them. And he's recounting that whole story. And it says in verse 18, and when they heard these things, the apostles, they held their peace, their peace and glorified God saying, then also hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life, right? And that's talking about salvation, right? You know, salvation is a covenant that we have that's given to us in the form of a grant. That's not something that, you know, we have to work to get right? It's not of works lest any man should boast. It's the gift of God, right? It's a gift. It's a grant. You know what? It's also a covenant. You know, God has made a covenant with us that if we will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall have everlasting life. We'll have eternal life. We'll never lose it, so on and so forth. So that's a good illustration of the difference between, you know, a grant and a treaty, that, which is what you find within a covenant. You know, every one of these covenants that you look at are, are, and here's the thing, people want to say, well, you know, he made a covenant here with no strings attached. Well, and people paint with a broad brush. When, you, when we're going to look at this passage here, you can see a mixture of both. There's some things that are just given unconditionally, and the, but there is an aspect of, you know, some, some expectations. There's, you know, it's both a grant in some forms, but then in other ways, it's also a treaty. Does that make sense? There's some things that he is, is expecting, right? But there's also some things that are just a given when it comes to the Davidic covenant. And that's the one thing, the covenant I want to focus in on here this morning. <clears throat> so again, uh, what is the difference between a, a grant and a treaty? One's unconditional, one is unconditional. If you want to go over to uh, go over to 1 Kings, go to 1 Kings chapter 2. Keep something in 2 Samuel chapter 7, 2 Samuel 7. So, for example, you know, this unconditional promise, this grant is given to David here in 2 Samuel. And what is that grant? Is that his seed would proceed after him, right? Now, was that what Saul got? Because he brings up Saul in this passage. Saul did not get that. His seed was cut off, right? He was, his seed did not inherit the throne. The throne was taken from him and given to David. And now David, when he gets it, he is given this promise. It says there, in verse 12, and when thy days shall be fulfilled, you know, when you die, <clears throat> and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall so proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. So David is given this promise, this covenant, that his seed is going to reign upon the throne even after he dies, okay? <clears throat> so that was the unconditional promise to David that his seed is going to proceed after him. That if anyone's going to sit upon the throne of Israel, it's going to be from his lineage. It's not going to be, he's not going to bring in, an, like he did with Saul, he's not going to you know, take, out, take out you know the house of Benjamin and bring in the house of Judah. It's always going to be the Davidic line that sits upon that throne. That's the unconditional portion of this covenant. Okay, that part of it is not, you know, that's not, there's nothing, no strings attached. Okay, now, but there are strings attached to whether or not his seed gets to sit upon that throne. The, the throne is there for him to sit upon, right? If anyone's going to fill that throne, it's going to be the seed of David. But whether or not they get to take advantage of that, as, you know, if I'm, if I'm an heir uh, of David, if I am one who is eligible to sit on the throne, then I have to meet certain criteria, right? Because we've seen where God, you know, takes, <laughs> takes the throne from them or puts them out of the throne, rather, and they're, you know, they have no king right, when they go into captivity. 
So the unconditional promise to, to David is that his seed would proceed after him, that there would be the seed of David sitting upon that throne, and that his house or his kingdom would be established forever. He said in verse 16, and thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before the end in 2 Samuel 8. <clears throat> now the treaty part, you know, is the part that is conditional. And this favors the giver. You know, both, both parties usually benefit, obviously. But this is kind of a, you know, a, 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 a surety for the giver of the grant. Kind of like when we sign a lease, right? If I sign a lease, I'm signing like a treaty. I'm signing an agreement. I'm making a promise with, you know, the one who is leasing to me that I'm going to pay X amount of rent on time for X amount of, X amount of time. And if I break that covenant, if I break that lease, you know, I have to pay that money whether I occupy the building or not, right? So you can see how that kind of benefits the giver, not just the recipient. And God, you know, he wants to make sure that if he's going to set up somebody on his throne, and he made these conditions, you know, we could talk about the other, uh, you know, covenants that he made with Israel. Hey, you'll be my people if you walk in my ways and keep my commandments, right? Why? So that you would be a light unto the Gentiles, Right? God has these stipulations because if you're going to sit and, and represent me, you're going to live right. You're going to do things right. Okay, So that's kind of the conditional aspect of this. This favors the Lord a little bit because he's going to be represented correctly. Because if the, if the king, you know, David's line, right, sets on that throne and starts to do things amiss, starts to do wickedness, you know, that's going to look bad on the nation. It's going to look bad upon God. Remember when David committed the sin with Bathsheba, what was, what was the, he got rebuked and said, you've given great occasion for the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, right? That was a reproach against God, even. You know, he was sitting on that throne. That throne was promised to him in his seed. But you know what? Because of what he did, there was a punishment involved because he brought reproach upon the name of Christ. Did I have you go to, you went to 1 Kings, right? <clears throat> You know, the, the, the king, the throne was there for the seed of David. They are going to get to sit upon that throne. Whoever it is that's going to, you know, if someone's going to fill that throne of David or that throne that, that God sets up, it's going to be the seed of David. It's not just going to be anybody else. But that, that's the unconditional aspect. The conditional aspect is if you're going to sit on that throne as the seed of David, there's certain criteria that you have to meet. And, you know, we, we could read about that in Deuteronomy 17 where God told, said that the king would not multiply to himself horses and that he would not uh, return to Egypt. And one thing that he was told not to do was not to multiply wives to himself. Now, did Solomon do that? Oh, yeah, <laughs> big time. I mean, he had more than David. That's probably where he learned it. You know, there's another sermon right there. But he multiplied to himself a lot of wives. I mean, 700 wives and concubines. So that's, you know, that's one thing that he did that was explicitly told not to do in the scripture, okay? And we understand that there was consequences for that, right? His heart was turned, and, and eventually God, even, even David himself, you know, taking Bathsheba to wife and the whole sin there, that ended up, there was consequences for that. The kingdom was taken, was divided, right? If you remember the story. So David's heirs, they have the covenant, they have the promise that the throne is theirs. That's unconditional, but it's conditional in that it's theirs as long as they behave. If they misbehave, they lose it. If you look at 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 1, it says there, now, 2 Kings 2, verse 1, Now the days of David drew nigh that he should die, and he charged Solomon his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth. Be thou strong, and show thyself a man, and keep the charge of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes and his commandments. He didn't say, look, we got the promise of God. The throne is ours. Do whatever you want. <laughs> It's carte blanche, son. You know, we can just do whatever we want. We've got this unconditional promise that our seed is going to sit upon this throne forever. No, that is the unconditional portion of this covenant. Yes, it's going to be the seed of David that sits upon that throne, but the seed of David must behave themselves. They must walk uprightly if they want to take advantage of that covenant. He said, keep charge uh, of the Lord thy, and keep the charge of the Lord thy God, verse 3, to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that thou mayest prosper in all that, that thou doest. So he wasn't just going to automatically prosper just because, you know, he was David's son. You know, and every king that came after him in the Davidic line could just say, well, you know, David's my great granddaddy, therefore I'm going to prosper. No, you have the opportunity to sit upon the throne, but if you want to prosper, if you want to, in all that thou doest, you have to do what? You have to keep all these commandments, these testimonies, these statutes, so on and so forth. 
He says there in verse 4, that the Lord may continue his word which he spake concerning me, saying, if thy children take heed to their way to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, there shall not fail thee, said he, a man of the, on the throne of Israel. So did you catch that there? There's, there? there's that clause within this covenant. He's saying, look, your seed is going to continue. The, the throne is going, to be in, is going to be occupied by your seed from now on. But if they're going to do that, if thy children take heed to thy way and walk in truth with all the heart and with all their soul, there shall not fail thee. So there's an if attached to it. Not meaning that, well, if they fail to do it, I'm going to find somebody else, just meaning that there's going to be, there's just no one's going to sin in it. Or if they fail to do the right thing, you know, they're not going to prosper. They're going to be chastened, right? And that's exactly what you see happen. You know, after Solomon, you know, you, the, 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 it gets, the, the, uh, the kingdom gets split. Jer uh, Rehoboam, his son, sits upon the throne. Jeroboam takes over the, the northern tribes. And then, and then from there on out, it's just chastening, 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 chastening. A king comes along in the Davidic line, starts to do right. God blesses. The next one comes along, does wickedness, and God curses, right? But it's always the seed of David that's sitting upon that throne. That's the unconditional aspect. But... You always, but there's also the conditional aspect, the treaty portion of that covenant, where if God is going to bless him sitting upon that throne, he has to walk after the Lord and live for the Lord. So the Davidic covenant, you could see how, and this is a good, you know, this is a good thing to keep in mind if you consider any of the other covenants that God made. Because people want to just paint with this broad brush and say, well, it's unconditional no matter what. Uh, well, no, there are other conditions. Not, now, not always, but, you know, it's usually a mix of the two. Okay, you have some things that are unconditional and some things that are conditional. <clears throat> so the Davidic covenant, God, you know, he, he, he makes this covenant with David saying, hey, your seed is going to sit upon this throne. And that throne is then what? An eternal throne. Okay. And, and this is where we kind of get into a little bit of the, the prophecy side of this. Okay. This, this covenant. Because remember, all these covenants that we see in Scripture all point to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Davidic covenant, you know, is no exception. If anything, the Davidic covenant is probably the most obvious one, that it's the seed of David that is going to inhabit an eternal throne. Look, if God is saying your throne is going to be established forever, you know, that, that, that's an eternal throne that has been promised, okay? That is the Davidic covenant, that, it, that it's an eternal throne. Are you still in 2 Samuel? If you go back to seven, uh, chapter 7, Verse 15, but my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. And thy throne shall be established forever. So God is saying, look, thy throne is going to be established forever. Now, but we just read all his conditions, right? That if he wants that throne to be blessed, he's got to behave. There's got to be, you know, he's got to walk after his statutes. However, that throne is a promise to David eternally, forever. Okay, <clears throat> so and even in this verse, you see it here. He says, look, thine house, you know, this is that, that conditional part, right? Thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever. You know, the individuals, thy, his house, those that came after him, they could, you know, invalidate their promise through sin, okay? They could, they, they could uh, they'd still have the throne, but they won't have the blessing. That's the conditional part. And we, we know we saw that with David and Solomon. But notice there, he says, thy throne, this is an, an, a grant, this is unconditional, thy throne shall be established forever. He said, thy house and thy kingdom shall be established forever, thy throne shall be established forever. Now, we're going to get into here how Christ fulfills the Davidic covenant, okay? How Christ fulfills the Davidic covenant. So, but we need to understand, first of all, is that, you know, David, the Davidic covenant, the, it was, it was, unconditional, or excuse me, it was conditional in the immediate sense that if, if, you know, one of his heirs failed to keep the statutes and the commandments and the judgments, there was going to be a punishment. It wasn't just, you know, this free-for-all, this pass to just do whatever they wanted as king, okay? It was conditional, it was conditional in that sense. However, it was unconditional in the far-reaching sense in that his seed would rule after him. Right, that was the promise. Look, I don't know how it's going to go for your seed, but they're the ones that are going to go, go ahead and inhabit the, the, your throne. And that seed, we understand, ultimately is Christ. You know, He is that seed that's going to sit upon that eternal throne. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. Okay, 
So the promise to David <clears throat> was that his seed, not himself, would reign upon his throne. And it's important to understand that because when we get back into Jeremiah, in fact, if you want to go over to uh, Jeremiah 33, Jeremiah 33, just a, a few chapters over where we read this morning, uh, you, you'll start to see where people say, well, this means that David is going to be reestablished in the throne during, uh, you know, during the millennium, that he's going to come in and he's going to rule and reign upon his, li literally reign upon the same throne. Now, this is just my opinion. I don't believe that. You know, and has anyone ever heard that? Has anyone heard, you know, people say, hey, David's going to be reestablished in the throne. It's, it's definitely out there. You heard it. Okay, I got a hand over there. I see that hand. God bless you. But that's what some, you know, and I've, I've always scratched my head when I've heard that. I said, how, where, does, where does that come from? How do they, I thought David, was, you know, was just a picture of Christ, right? That, that it's ultimately Christ that's going to go ahead and fulfill that throne. Well, they get that from passages like we read this morning in Jeremiah 30. We're going to look at them. But we have to understand that the part of this Davidic covenant is that his, his seed is going to reign upon the throne, right? And there in verse 33, chapter 33, verse 19, Jeremiah 33, 19, and the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, if ye can break my covenant of the day and my covenant of the night, and that there should be not day or, or and night in their season, then may also my covenant be broken with David my servant. So this is a pretty strong promise. He's saying, look, if you, can, if you can make it so there's less than 24 hours day and night, or you can, if you can change the seasons, you know, if you can change night and day, then you can break my promise. That's, you know, that's how serious God is about it. Then, all, uh, then may also my covenant be broken with David, my servant, that he should not, what? That he should not reign upon the throne? Is that what it says? No, it says that he should not have a son to reign upon his throne. He's saying, look, there shall be his seed, his son, his, uh, you know, those that come after him are going to reign upon that throne. That's the promise. Not that David he, himself would reign upon it. <clears throat> if you go over to, uh, go over to, uh, just go over to Isaiah chapter 9. You know what? Go to Luke 1. Go to Luke 1. Keep something in Jeremiah. Go to Luke 1. And God makes this promise over and over, but it's important that we understand that this promise is to his seed and not to David himself. That's what we read in 2 Samuel. He said, hey, your, you know, there's going, your throne is going to be established forever. You know, your seed is going to inhabit that throne forever. Okay? The Bible says in Psalm 132, the Lord hath sworn in truth unto David he will not turn from it of the fruit of thy body I will set upon the, will I set upon the throne. If thy children will keep my covenant and my testimony that I shall that I shall teach them, their children shall also sit upon thy throne forevermore. So the promise is, is that the fruit of his body is going to sit on the throne, not that David himself is going to sit upon the throne. Okay. We all know Isaiah 9 6, right? At least around Christmas we do. Right? It says, for unto, a child, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. So who's, who's the government's uh, shoulder, who's, uh, whose shoulders is the government going to sit upon? It's going to sit upon the child that is born, the son that is given. It's going to be called, it's going to be on the one who is named the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. And the increase of his government and his peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with just judgment and justice. This is talking about Jesus Christ, okay? But notice that government, when it rests upon his shoulders, when he sits as the Prince of Peace, when his government is increased and, there is the, and the peace thereof knows no end, he's going to do that what? Upon the throne of David, okay? He's going to be the one that's sitting upon the throne of David, not David, okay? You read it again there in Luke chapter 1 where I had you, uh, turn, verse 30, Luke 1, 30, And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God, and behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord shall give unto him the throne of his father David. So again, it's that throne is promised to David's seed. That seed is Christ. He's the one that's going to sit upon that throne and rule and reign. Not, not David himself, okay? Well, we'll get to what's going to happen to David, right? Well, where's David going to be? Well, let's, let's not worry about that yet. <laughs> we'll see. <clears throat> and it says in verse 33, And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. And we understand that Jesus Christ is of David's lineage. Okay, He comes from David's line. That's why he is an heir to that throne. He has right to that throne, to claim that throne. 
And we could turn to all those places. Go to Romans chapter 1. That's what they called him. Remember blind Bartimaeus? When he cried after David, or cried after Jesus, he said, Jesus, thou son of David. And he called him that twice. Right? That people knew that's who Christ was. That's who the Messiah was going to be. The seed of David. Right? Because they have that, they understood that this covenant, this promise that was made with David, you know, uh, meant that his seed was going to be the one that sits on the throne. Right? And that the Messiah was going to rule and reign. Romans, Romans chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God, which he hath promised before by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Okay? Probably everybody in here gets that. You probably all understand that. Okay? If you want to study the genealogies in Matthew and Luke and, and just study the Scriptures, you know, you, and like Romans 1, you see that Jesus Christ is the seed of David. That's why he's the one that's going to rule and reign upon that throne. So in my opinion, you know, David is not going to be reinstated at the millennium. You know, and a lot of people teach this. I've heard, I've heard this from multiple, play, multiple sources. And look, this isn't, this is a, obviously, you know, this is a, this is minutia in scripture. You know, this is finer details in, in, in concerning prophecy and things like that. This isn't, this isn't something people divide over. At least I don't think so. <laughs> I've never seen it happen. I don't know. Maybe I'll get called out. You know, maybe they'll be the, maybe I'll be branded a heretic from here on out. But, you know, my, what I, I'm just being honest with the scriptures. I'm just reading it and just saying, look, it sounds to me like Jesus is the one that's going to sit upon the throne of David, not David. The promise to David was, hey, anyone that sits on that throne is going to be of your line, your seed, but it's not going to be you, <laughs> right? So that's just my opinion. You know, people can disagree. You can disagree with me here and still come to church here, you know, and uh, we, we can still be friends, right? So that position, you know, is not going to be filled by David, in my opinion. It's going to be filled by his seed, Jesus Christ. You say, well, where do they get this? You know, where do, they, where do people get this teaching that David is going to be reinstated upon the throne? And, well, Jeremiah 30, if you're still there, you might have caught it this morning when the Bible was being read. Um, in verse 5, you know, this is some of the proof text. I'm going to just start in verse 5 because I like verses 5 through 7. It says, For thus saith the Lord, we have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, not of peace. Ask you now, and see whether a man doth travail with child. I can't read this and not just talk about this a little bit. This has nothing to do with the sermon, but it's, it's like God saying, did you, did you hear something? Is that a woman screaming in pain? And he's saying, well, it sounds like a man. Because he looks around and he says, Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail, and if all faces are turned to paleness? You know, this is how bad things are gotten. The, the men are so scared that they, they sound like they're screaming out like women, right? Look, when a woman's in tra travail with labor, it's expected that she's going to, you know, hands upon the knees screaming in pain. Like, that's, that's expected. But when a man's doing it, that's not a good thing, right? Anyway, that's, I always love that passage. <laughs> Verse 7, Alas, for the day is that great, that day is great, so that none is like it, and is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it, for it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck, and will burst thy bonds, uh, uh, burst thy bonds, and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him, that they shall serve the Lord their God, and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them. So he's saying, and this is talking about when they come back out of the Babylonian captivity. Okay, that's the primary interpretation here. Okay, this isn't... I don't, I don't want to go off on all that, but notice here that he's saying, look, in verse 9, that when that happens, when they are, you know, when their bonds are burst, when, when they serve no more strangers, they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them. Now, David's already dead at this point in the story. Remember, David's already dead. You know, he's already in the sepulcher. They're about to go into the captivity, and he's just saying, look, you're going to go into captivity, but you're going to come back, and David's going to rule over you. Right, but what he means by that is, you know, he's he's is speaking about the fact that David's seed is going to rule over them. Okay, David's seed is going to be the one that rules. Therefore, fear thou not, O my servant Jacob, saith to saith the Lord. You say, but it says right there, and David, their king, whom I will raise up unto them. It sounds real specific. It doesn't say it's a seed. It doesn't say it's the fruit of his body. Right, but just stick with me because there's another proof that you know that is what it's talking about. That this is a typology in Scripture. Okay. And you could apply this to when they came out of the captivity, and you could also apply this to the millennial reign. You know, that when God's people, you know, come through the tribulation, 
they're going to have David sit upon the throne or Jesus Christ, his seed, sit upon the throne, okay? Now go to Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel chapter 37. This is another proof text that people will turn to and say, see, David is going to be the one that sits upon the throne during the millennial reign, okay? Ezekiel chapter 37, look at verse 20. It says there, And the sticks <clears throat> whereon thou writest shall be in thine hand before their eyes, and shall say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be to them all. And they shall be no more two nations, neither shall they be divided into kingdoms any more at all. Neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idol, idols, nor with detestable things, nor with their transgressions. But I will save them out of their dwelling places, wherein they shall have sinned, and I will cleanse them, so that they shall be my people, and I will be their God. Now verse 24, And David my servant shall be king over them, and they all shall have one shepherd. They also shall walk in my judgments, and observe my statutes, and do them. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt, and they shall dwell therein, even they and their children and their children's children forever, and my servant David shall be their prince forever. So again, this is another proof text that they turn to and say, look, David's going to be reinstated upon the throne of Israel during the millennial reign. <clears throat> but what we got to understand here is that David in these passages is just a type of Christ. Okay? It's just a picture. It's just a typology of Christ. And that's what David is. You know, no one, you know, Anyone who reads and studies or preaches the Bible is going to agree that David is a picture of Christ in the Old Testament. And, you know, we could see other examples of this, okay? Another great example of, uh, you know, someone being named as a type to come, you know, is, is Elijah or John the Baptist, that relationship there, okay? Because people say, well, it says David. It says King David. He's going to be the one that sits upon the throne. But we've just read in the beginning of the sermon all those passages where it's, your seed shall sit upon the throne. Your seed shall sit upon the throne. You know, when Christ comes, he's going to sit upon the throne of David. He's going to be the one that inhabits that throne, not David himself, okay? So you have to, you have to, you know, you have to take these passages in Ezekiel and Jeremiah and make them, you know, jive with the rest of Scripture. You can't just say, well, it says David, therefore it must be David, because that doesn't go with the rest of Scripture, in my opinion. It doesn't, they doesn't go together. But when you understand that David is a type of Christ, then it makes sense. Well, so why, why, are we, why is he saying that David is going to rule over them when David's already dead? Because David is a picture of Christ to come, okay? And you get a great example of this if you want to go over to Malachi chapter 4. That's the last book in the Old Testament, right before the New Testament. Malachi, okay? You get a great, you know, another example of this is where Malachi says, hey, Elijah is going to come before the day of the Lord, before uh, the Lord comes. You know, he's going to be one that shows up before the Lord shows up. In Malachi chapter 4, look at verse 5. It says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the, curse, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. And that's why they were confused, right? That's why they were going to John the Baptist. Art thou that prophet? You know, art, art thou the Christ? Art thou that prophet? Are you he that should come? Right? And they were thinking that this isn't, this isn't Elijah. This is, we know who this is. This is John the Baptist, right? Go to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. But that's what you have in Malachi saying, Elijah's coming. It's going to be Elijah that comes, right? Well, you know, that's what it said in Ezekiel about, in Jeremiah about David, right? So, well, it's David that's coming. And people say, want to think, well, that literally means David, that he's going to be the one that sits upon the throne. No, it literally means, <laughs> it doesn't mean literally mean anything, <laughs> It's, it's a picture of Christ. That's what it is. Just like Elijah is a picture of John the Baptist, okay? If you're going to Matthew 11. It said in Mark 9, and they asked him, saying, What say uh, the scribes that Elias must, come for, must first come? Elias is the New Testament translation of Elijah, right? And he answered and told them, Elias verily come first and restoreth all things, and how it is written in the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be said it not. But I say unto you, this is what Jesus is saying, he said that Elias is indeed come, and they have done unto him whatsoever they listed as it is written of him. He's saying, yeah, Elias is going to come first, and you know what? He already has come, and they did whatever they wanted to him. He's talking about John the Baptist, okay? And you say, well, I'm not sure about that. Okay, Matthew 11 makes it real clear. Matthew 11, verse 11. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, 
Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent taketh by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you will receive it, this is Elias, which was born to come. He says, look, all the, all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And what do they say about John? That John is Elias, which was to come. That's what you're saying, that this John is Elias. But when you read Malachi, he's saying, look, this, this is, uh, you know, it's literally saying Elijah. That's why the scribes are scratching their heads saying, well, we thought Elijah was supposed to come. You know, that's why a lot of people today are saying, what, you know, David's going to be the one that's going to be set up on that throne. No, we need to understand that this is simply a picture. This is a type of Christ. Okay. It's not going to be literally be David. David, you will say, well, what's going to happen to David then? What, what, poor David. Look, David had a shot. Okay. <laughs> David had his moment in the sun. All right. David, David, David's good. I don't think David's up there, you know, arguing with the Lord about this. You know, that promise technically, you know, he's perfectly happy with what he got. Okay. But David, like all saints, okay, is going to rule and reign with Christ. Look, here's the thing about, you know, the millennium. Christ is going to sit upon the throne of David. The government's going to rest upon his shoulders, but David is going to rule and reign just like the rest of us. Did you know that we're also going to rule and reign in the millennial kingdom? That that's something that we have? That's a promise that we have as well? Now, we're not all going to sit upon the throne of David. No, that's Christ's spot. He's the one that gets that. He's, he's the king of king and lord of lords, right? But we get to, the, the, we have the privilege and the opportunity to serve along beside him or under him, under his authority, with his authority. If you would, go over to, I won't have you go to Daniel, but go over to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter number 2. The Bible says in Daniel 7, And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. Okay? That kingdom under the whole heaven is going to be given to who? The saints of the Most High. Now, who are the saints of the Most High? Look around. You're looking at them, right? It's not, it's not, you know, some corpse that they have in a Catholic church somewhere. This is a saint. Well, he wasn't even saved, right? The saints are the people that are saved. We are saints, okay? That's me and you. And the saints, you know, they are going to have, the, 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 the kingdom under the whole heaven is going to be given to them, right? The kingdom of the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. It's about the millennial reign. Okay, but we are going to share in that reign with Christ. Luke 19, I'll read to you, it says, And he said unto them, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in very little, very little, have thou authority over ten cities. Of course, it's the parable of the ten talents and the ten servants, remember? And the, the, the good servants that came back and returned their talents and did something with it, he's saying, Look, you've been faithful over very little, have authority over ten cities. Look, I don't think that's just, you know, it's, it's not just a parable. I think we literally are going to rule and reign over cities. Now, not everybody, you know, but those that, you know, do something with their Christian life that serve God here and now that are faithful in what? Very little. You know, the, the, the job that God has given us to do now on this earth of reaching the lost and living for the Lord, that's little, right? Like we talked about Thursday, it's our reasonable service to present our bodies a living sacrifice, okay? That was, that, that was something we talked about Thursday. But he's saying, look, if you do that, if you're faithful now in this life to Christ, when he comes and sits upon the throne of David and rewards his servants, part of that reward is that we rule and reign with him, and there are going to be some people that are going to get five cities, some people are going to get two cities, some people are going to get ten cities, some people are going to get no cities. Some, he's going to be like, you just take the, you go mop the floor, or just stand there. You know, I don't know. Right? You probably don't have to mop in heaven, I don't know. But, you know, some people are not going to have as much authority as others, okay? And that's, and that, and that's uh, all based upon how we live our lives now, okay? <laughs> You're in Revelation chapter 2, verse 26. It says, And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. Who is he that overcometh but he that believeth that Jesus is the Christ, right? That's who overcomes. That's me and you. If you believe, you are an overcomer. Or you've overcome the world through your faith in Christ. He's saying here, he that overcometh and keepeth my works, right? He that is faithful with little unto the end, to him will I give power 
over the nations. To him, will he, you know, he's going to rule over certain cities. He's going to rule over certain regions. You know, the, the, the kingdom is going to be given to the saints of the Most High. Right? They're going to rule and reign with him. He said, I will give him power over the nations. That's talking about the, about the saved. And he shall rule them with the rod of iron. Now notice there, in the, you know, at the end of verse 26, that's not a period. Right? It's a colon. He doesn't go, it's, not, it's not the end of a statement. It's not, oh, he's going to get power over the nations, right, to the saved, and he, the Lord, shall rule with the rod of iron. Now, the Lord is going to rule with the rod of iron, right? We understand that. We could go to Psalms 2, we go to Revelation 12, 19, where it says that Jesus, the Lord, is, is going to rule with the rate of rod of iron. But if we're going to rule with him and under his authority, we also are going to rule with the rod of iron, meaning we are going to have the same level of authority because we're going to be doing things in his name, in his stead, in his will. Okay, that's why it says that he will give him power over the nations and he, talking about the one who's going to be given power over the nations, the he that has overcome, he shall rule them with the rod of iron. So we're going to rule with the rod of iron too, okay? Now, I don't know if that's literally a rod of iron, right? Speaking figuratively, like if you go to Psalms, it's talking about the fact that he's going to have, you know, uh, he's going to, there's, there's going to be no resisting that power. He's going to dash them as a potter's vessel with the rod of iron. It's going to be like taking a piece of rebar and, and smashing your mother's face, right? If you know what that's like, you're probably a very bad, bad boy, no, right? But that's, that's, that's the picture there, that there's just no resisting that. You know, a clay pot isn't going to stand a chance against a piece of, you know, a rod of iron. <clears throat> and we're going to have that same authority. And look, that's where David is, because David's a saint just like me and you, Right? Now, David has the honor and the privilege of the fact that it's his seed that sits upon his throne, right? But as far as where he is in this whole picture, I believe he's going to be ruling and reigning right alongside us. He's going to be a saint just like us. <clears throat> you know, the Bible says in Ephesians that Christ hath raised us up together and made us sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You know, he's given us a throne. He's given us authority. He's given us a position in his kingdom. Go to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. Look, this isn't a small subject in the scripture. This is, you know, us reigning in the millennium isn't just something that's, uh, you know, alluded to a little bit. Like, and people just kind of, well, it kind of sounds like that. It's real clear, you know, the way I read it, that we are going to rule and reign. You know, you got Daniel, you got Luke, you got Revelation, multiple places in Revelation. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? He's saying, don't you know this? Haven't you read Daniel? Anyone hear, hear what I've been saying to you? that you're going to rule uh, and judge the world, that the saints are going to do that? And if you shall be, the world shall be judged by you, are you not unworthy to judge the smallest manners? Revelation chapter 3, verse 21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and sat down with my father in his throne. You know, we're going to have that privilege to sit with him in his throne, okay? Go to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter number 20. You know, David's not going to be the only one that reigns during the millennium. It's not like David gets reinstated in his throne and we're all subject to him. The, the way it really is going to work out is that Christ is reinstated in David's throne because he is the seed of David. He's going to fulfill this covenant. And we're all going to, along with David, are going to rule underneath him and, and with his authority. Okay. Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast nor his image, neither received his mark upon their foreheads or in the hands, and they lived, and what else did they do? They lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. It wasn't just that they were, you know, resurrected. It wasn't just that they, you know, uh, went to heaven and they got to live with Jesus. Not only did they live with him, they also reigned with him. Why? Because they were beheaded. They were uh, you know, for the word of God. They did not worship the beast. They were faithful and little, right? So it doesn't sound like little, you know, but that's just a vapor, right? Being beheaded. Being beheaded sounds pretty easy, to be honest. <laughs> right? And as long as they're not doing it like the Muslims do it. As long as it's like the French, you know, or just humane, just get me, get me at the guillotine. I could think of a lot worse ways to die, right? You know, I'm not going to go into it. But I mean, I'm, I'm thinking, hey, these beheadings are, aren't, aren't going to be, you know, because remember, Satan, he's going to be cast down like lightning, he's, and he, he knows that he has a short time to accomplish his will. He's trying to make war with heaven, right? 
He's not interested in, in torturing Christians. He wants to wipe them out as fast as he can in, in some vain attempt to, to beat God or something. So I think it's just going to be, hey, let's take as many people to hell with us. Let's get these Christians out of here so they quit preaching. That means no slow, agonizing death. It means beheading. It means quick, fast. The, the point is get them dead, right? So now, you know, you can kind of see how that's really not that big a deal. <laughs> that's, being, that's being faithful and little to have your head cut off. Okay, but if you do that, you know what? You're going to reign with Christ, right? Being faithful and little, even if it means having to lose your head, literally, okay? How about the fact, you know, the apostles were promised that they will sit upon 12 thrones. You know, say, no, it's David. He's going to sit and rule and reign. No, the Bible said that Jesus told the apostles that you shall sit upon the 12 thrones in the, what, the re regeneration. So he said, Matthew, go to Revelation 17. Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And David. Oh, wait, no. It's going to be the twelve tribes that judge, okay? It's going to be the saints that rule and reign with him. Okay? But ultimately, it's to be Christ that sits upon the throne of David, fulfilling this covenant that he made all the way back in 2 Samuel. He is the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's the only potentate. Look at Revelation chapter 17, verse 14. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for He is the Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with Him are called chosen and faithful. So He is the Lord of lords. He is the King of kings. He's the one that's going to rule and reign in the seat of David. Go to Hebrews chapter number 8. Hebrews chapter 8. We're going to close here. You say, well, what's the point of this? You know, what's the point of going over the Davidic covenant? Well, what was the point of the Davidic covenant? It's to point us to Christ. You know, it's the point, it was to point them to the fact that the seed of David was going to rule and reign upon that throne, that it was going to be his heir, right? The Messiah was going to be of the seed of David, that they would be able to, you know, look and say, oh, this Jesus, you know, he is of that lineage, right? Now, that didn't happen for them. They rejected that. The Jews of that day did, <clears throat> and the Jews of today, by the way. But the point is, is that like all covenants, you know, Christ is the one that fulfills them. That's what, that's what I want us to point out, that he is ultimately the fulfillment of all covenants, whether you want to talk about, you know, the Adamic covenant. And that's what I'm saying. Like they, people really dive into this whole covenant business. And it's true, it's there. You know, you can't deny the fact that God made covenants. He made a covenant with Adam, didn't he? Right? He said, you know, uh, he said to, to, to uh, Eve that, you know, that, 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 the, that he shall bruise the serpent's head and he shall bruise thy heel. Right? Under the woman he said, thou shalt bruise his head, and, you know, thy seed shall bruise his head and thou shalt bruise his heel. That Christ, her seed was going to come and, you know, defeat Satan. You know, that was a covenant that was made with Adam. That's the Adamic covenant. But who fulfilled that? Christ did. Right? He's the one that is the seed of the woman. There's the Noahic covenant, right? That it was going to be Noah's lineage. Well, David is the son of Shem, right? There's the Abrahamic covenant, right? Well, he is the son of Abraham, right? That's Abraham's seed, right? There's the Mosaic covenant, you know? But Christ is the one that fulfilled the law. There is the Palestinian covenant. Well, they love this one, right? About the land over there, the dirt. Right? But who is it that's going to rule upon that dirt? Jesus. He's the one that's going to rule from where? From Jerusalem. Okay? There's the Davidic covenant we've been talking about all this morning. Well, he's the one that's going to sit upon that throne of David. He's going to be Jesus. But, you know, these are, these are all covenants that are there, and Christ is the fulfillment of them, but, and, and people want to make a big deal about these different covenants. Right? But when you get into Hebrews, where we are in chapter 8, it seems to me like there's really only one covenant that God makes a big deal about. I mean, brings up too. You don't see God saying, this is my first covenant, this is my second covenant, this is my third covenant, this is my fourth covenant, this is my fifth. God doesn't number the covenants. Man did that. They'll say there are seven covenants that God has made with man throughout the ages. Right? And they'll list these covenants that I just read for you. But did God do that? No, man did that. Now, I'm not denying that there aren't covenants there, but they're all interwoven, they're all interrelated, and they all point to Christ. Okay, that's the point of it all. And that's why the one covenant that God emphasizes is what? The better covenant, the new covenant, 
right? And when you read Hebrews 8, it sounds to me like in God's mind, there's really only one, there's only two covenants, not seven. He said in verse 8, but now he hath obtained a more excellent ministry, be how much also he's the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. Now, verse 7, for if that what? First covenant. He's talking about the Mosaic covenant, which came, you know, came way later. <laughs> came after the Adamic covenant, came after the Noahic covenant, came after the Abrahamic covenant. You know, it came after all those things, but God says that first covenant. Because it's really, you know, the, all those covenants in the Old Testament are really just one covenant when you think about it. They all just kind of all point to Christ. That's the point of it all, okay? Obviously, there's, you know, specifics within each one, but they all point to Christ. And God just saying, look, that first covenant had been faultless, that Mosaic covenant. You know, if the law had been perfect, then there would have been no need for Christ to come and die for us. That's why, you know, people say, oh, I'm just going to be a good person. How are you going to go to heaven? Well, by just being a good person. Oh, then you don't need Jesus. Well, why did he come here for? All right? So if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he saith, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers when I took them out of the hand, to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regard them not, saith the Lord. So again, in my mind, you know, when I read it, it seems to me like God really only concerns himself with two covenants. The Mosaic covenant, that first covenant, the one that he made with his fathers, the one that they regarded not, neither he did, did he regard them. That, that first covenant wherewith he found fault with them. And therefore, Christ came and fulfilled all these covenants being what? The mediator of what? A better covenant. It's the better covenant. You know, we want to make a, people want to make a big deal about all these other covenants, like the Davidic covenant, so on and so forth. God makes a big deal about the covenant in Christ's blood, the New Testament. That's the one we need to make the big deal about because all these other covenants just point to that, right? But, you know, hopefully that cleared up some things, maybe about end times prophecy a little bit. You know, I, I've always scratched my head when I've heard people say David's going to sit upon the throne. I've always wondered where where is that coming from, you know. But now I just find out it's because I don't, you know, I don't agree with that, you know. So I'm done, you know. And maybe I'll get straightened out on that. I don't know. But that, to me, that seems pretty clear that it's going to be it's going to be Christ that sits upon that throne, fulfilling that Davidic covenant because He is the fulfillment of all covenants. That's why He is the mediator of a better covenant. Let's go ahead and pray.